it was set up to stop another world war. We cannot aim at anything less than the Union of Europe as a whole. And unprecedented peace led to prosperity. But 60 years later, the European Union is in the midst of an economic and political crisis. Thousands have taken to the streets in protest. From the turmoil in the Eurozone to the rise of the far right and separatist movements, the future of the EU now looks in peril. The Euro Titanic has now hit the iceberg. So where will Europe go from here? I'm Mehdi Hassan, and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head to head with Vivian Redding, the former vice president of the European Commission and one of federal Europe's staunchest defenders. I'll challenge her on whether the European project is now dead, and I'll ask her how the European Union can win back the trust of its citizens. Tonight, I'll also be joined by Margot Parker, member of the European Parliament for the anti-European UK Independence Party, Professor Kostas Lapovitsas from SOAS University in London and author of the book Crisis in the Eurozone, and Professor Stephen Hassler, director of the Global Policy Institute in London. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Vivian Redding. She's an influential member of the European Parliament and close ally of the new president of the European Commission. <laughs> Vivian, flatlining growth, falling prices, rising unemployment, more than six years on from the financial crash, Europe and in particular the single currency zone, the Eurozone, still has massive problems, doesn't it? The crisis isn't over, uh, people are committing suicide, the far right is on the rise, the continent looks more and more like it's on the verge of a second Great Depression. Oh, yes. does it? Yes, to some. Okay. Not to you? No, not to me. Now, you all must know where we are coming from, because it started in the United States, banking crashing, then the banks crashed in Europe. Governments helped the banks out because we in Europe need the banks for financing the economy. It's different than the United States. The United States does that through the market directly. We do it through the banks. So the government needed to help the banks. That led them uh, to a financial crisis in their budgets. And the whole system was destabilized. The yes. US, where it started, you say, recovered its lost growth nearly three years ago. The US has yep. half the unemployment of it the does. EU and the Eurozone. Why is the EU in such a bad place when the US isn't? The US Surely through bad policies, bad decisions. No. The US has a big advantage over the European Union. The US had a centralized system on these questions. We did not. We had not in our sui generis system, where you do not have a unified national state, but 28 national states working together, we had in our treaties and in our systems not the instruments in order to fight that. So we were doing management by panic at a certain moment, where we had to decide, do we leave one of our member states go into bankruptcy, or do we put in place very quickly a system in order not to leave this to go in bankruptcy. That was a, s a serious discussion, yes. believe me. There was definitely a panic in 2008 and all governments Absolutely. had to respond. Six years later though, you have one in four young people unemployed across the Eurozone. More than half of young people in Spain and Greece are out of work. That's the destruction of an entire European generation. Who's to blame for that? People would say specific policies supported by the EU Commission, ECB, austerity, uh, the straitjacket of having a single currency in such a diverse area, that's what's to wait, blame. Wait, wait, wait a moment. Some Eurozone countries who had uh, done their job have come out of uh, the mess. And uh, in Ireland, for instance, the investments last year were 19% up. So you see those who really did... Child poverty is up in Ireland ...who as well. did their job, they are on the way uh, out of this. The EU was saying in 2010 to Greece, for example, that they, Greece should do all these cuts and you'll contract by 2.5%. Greece contracted by 10 times that amount. You got it wrong. 
yeah, well. The prescription from yeah, the okay. Troika, from the IMF, the EU, yeah. no, from the no, Germans. No, people say Troika goes there and imposes. No. Troika makes an analysis and proposes. The ministers of finance of the Eurozone by unanimity decide then to present this. And the member state, in the case of Greece, for instance, has the government and the parliament to decide to apply this. So it is not the Troika which decides. Okay. But what was the problem in a country like Greece? The problem was that you had a blown up administration which was incapable to function. You had very high labor costs so that nothing could be exported anymore and you imported all your goods. You spend a lot of money without having revenue. That thing had to go bust. It went bust. In 2012 in Greece, the majority of Greeks voted either to delay or cancel austerity. What did Angela Merkel say? No, there can be no delay in these reforms. These were not choices that some of these countries made. These were choices that were imposed upon them and caused but severe I, I said, no, hardship. I don't, no, no, I don't understand. What are you saying there? The government said yes and the parliament said well, yes. After the government's changed, which was helpful. Well, well, if they, you take yeah, Greece well, as an example, <laughs> if it, you take... If it you is, take no, no, wait a moment. It is not helpful well, at all when you change your governments every six months. Stability is helpful. And I think that those governments which had strong leaders, they managed to do it. Those with feeble leaders didn't manage to do Some it. Some people think legitimacy is important as well. Don't, no, you are pretending now that in Europe we have governments which, are, which do not have a legitimacy. I'm saying that the austerity policies that countries like Greece and Spain brought in, no, didn't command majority support in many cases. We saw massive protests, we saw governments being changed, and then you see the results in Greece, yeah, for come, example. Come on, come on, Vivian, no, in no. Greece, in, in I, Greece, I, I, no, in no. Greece. No, we are not banana republics. We are democracies. Some may dispute mm? that point. No, um, sorry. You go to Greece, and you d I went to Greece, and I talked to aid yeah. workers in Greece who said this country has been reduced to the status of a developing country. 40% rise in suicides, um, unemployment at record levels. Uh, this is a country as a result of austerity measures that were, okay, not imposed, proposed from other countries, from Germany, from the EU, from the IMF, from the ECB. No, well, do, you feel I, no, do you feel no sense of responsibility for what happened in Greece no, as, no, as a former wait, EU wait commissioner? Wait a moment. I feel very sad uh, when I see that. Uh, it happens to be one of the countries uh, which I know uh, very well. And by the way, I was one of those politicians who went to Greece regularly. And we were really speaking eye to eye with those people. So I know what is going on there. And I know also that generations of politicians have ruined this country. And it was a mischief of all political parties. Over generations it happened. And the, the question was there, are we going to leave that country go bankrupt? And you know what would well, have been- Well, a lot been? of people were advising to write off the debts. Uh, you're right off the debts, okay. And then you are bankrupt, you go back to the drachma, what you are doing, you devaluate, but because it is a country which imports everything, it creates nearly nothing, that, but you have to pay then the things which you import by, uh, by dollars or by the euro, that means you are in sheer poverty and with no way to get out. When you look at the results of what has happened to the European economies over the last few years, um, you look at, for example, at history. It was mass unemployment that helped propel Hitler and the Nazis to power. Aren't you worried that today's mass unemployment, today's EU austerity and deflationary policies are helping a new generation of far-right, sometimes neo-Nazi parties, rise across Europe? We've had Golden Dawn in Greece, Jobbik in Hungary, the Front National in France, the Swedish Democrats, the Danish people, all doing very well in May's European elections. Many would argue because of the results of the failure of e EU economic policy. Even to countries which were not in trouble, the true Finns in Finland. Now, Finland is really not a country which is in economic trouble and where you have uh, a huge unemployment. So you see, there is a trend uh, towards the extreme right and the extreme left. You don't By believe the way, economic conditions are responsible? A lot of things are responsible, but it is not only one. I do not believe in simplistic explanations. Well, let's bring in our, our panel of uh, experts from different backgrounds. Margot Parker is a member of the European Parliament for the anti-EU UK Independence Party, UKIP. Uh, she was elected for the first time in May of this year. Um, Margot, Vivian says that there's never been any undemocratic aspects to this austerity, to the economic programme. There have never been any undemocratic governments or going against the will of the people. Is that your view? No, it's not my view at all. 
I must say, I think the Troika, uh, it's not democracy. I would really, really guard against your view. I don't agree with you at all. I think it's right that the Greek people have their say. I think it's right that people all over Europe have their democratic right to vote and say what they think. Uh, let me bring Professor Kostas Lapovitsas, who's a Greek economist, author of the book Crisis in the Eurozone. Uh, what's your view on, on the current e economic climate in Europe? The problem of Europe is not really Greece, and it's not really Ireland, and it's not really Spain. It's the policies of, of Germany, which are basically policies of keeping wages low, keeping its own people, basically, uh, on a low consumption path, and therefore acquiring a vast competitive advantage and squeezing the periphery, and increasingly now squeezing France and Italy. Let Vivian come back in there. Do you want to respond to those two points? Let's first come uh, to your point of view. Um, I know how the UKIP is uh, thinking and is doing uh, politics. By the way, you have um, allied with uh, a Polish uh, neo-Nazi. That is your democratic decision. And <laughs> do you want to do with Kostas's point that actually Germany is to blame here? The way it's the EU yeah, is run to benefit Germany. The euro, in Paul Krugman's word, was a backdoor stimulus for Germany. My response is that Germany does not take decisions alone. There was not one single proposal by the um, uh, Troika uh, after analysis of what needed to be done, which had not the unanimity of the finance ministers in the Eurogroup. And on the economic point he made, that Germany has benefited while the periphery countries have suffered. That's undisputable, surely. Germany was always one who said it, we need solidity. And I agree with this position, and I tell you why. I am in politics now 35 years, and I have always, before I took a decision, thought, what does this decision do to my three boys when they are going to be adults? And making debt is the worst thing you can do to the young generation, because they will have to pay it back. Very strongly point made. Margot, what's your response to the point about your new Polish MEP ally who's made well, jokes about wife okay. beating, said yes. Hitler was a good guy no, for no, cutting no. taxes? No, no, before he was... His leader uses the N-word, no, no. says me, women should be banned from let voting. Me, let me explain. Before he was actually brought in, we had an open meeting within our group. Nearly all of the ladies were on him like a ton of bricks, and we asked those serious questions. He categorically gave us his unequivocal answer, which was, no, that is something that has been built out of the newspaper articles, which are not true, and I give you my word, this is not the case. So you're comfortable Europe. with this guy and his views? He has given, no, not his views. He actually said this is not the case, so he's okay. been, I think, quite blackened. And his leader using the N-word and saying Hitler no, didn't no, know about the Jews? No, not at all, don't. not acceptable. Absolutely, without a doubt, not acceptable. But you lie with this Okay, guy. let me bring in you a very, very uh, okay, hold people. on, hold on, hold on. Very, very patient third panellist. Uh, Professor Stephen Hassler is here with us. He's an academic, a political scientist. <laughs> Director of the Global Policy Institute in London. Stephen, I want to make a point to you as someone who's pro-European, pro-EU. Isn't it ironic that the European Union and the Euro, the single currency, was set up to bring Europeans together? And in recent years, we've seen that it's actually divided Europe more than anything else. What's divided Europe? Don't lay austerity on the European Union. If you want to criticise austerity, criticise the neoliberal, free market, bankers, economic policy, which has caused it. And I think Vivian's absolutely right to open her remarks by saying, this crisis, which has led to austerity, <laughs> this crisis, which has led to austerity, was started on Wall Street, thousands of miles away from the European Union. And yet the US and the didn't and the do port, austerity and recovered and, and, the, and, and the Eurozone well, did. Well, the United States have done better because they spent money on quantitative easing, they put some, pushed some money into the economy. No, this is an uh, an austerity program, which, by the way, the British outside the Eurozone yep. have engaged in Very just as strongly. Yep. So let's not lay this on Europe. There were election results, Stephen, in which people came out and did blame Europe, by definition, by voting for anti-European parties. Oh, so oh, no, no, no. They're voting for the National Front. They're voting for our party, UKIP, here in my view, because they're fed up with the general system. These folks okay, well, are protesting. Well, that's a great segue. We're about no, to come to the not. general system. Before no, we do, not. very quickly, Costas, no, Golden Dawn in Greece. Uh, Vivian's saying there's different reasons for different parties, different parts of the country. How much do you think Eurozone policies and what happened to Greece helped Golden Dawn's rise, in your view? Before the crisis, Golden Dawn didn't exist, practically. It was a, it was a very minor organization. The reason why 
they blossomed for a period is because of the crisis, is because of what has been brought to Greece. And may I say that austerity has been institutionalized by the European Union because this isn't an alliance of equal partners. This is a myth. I don't know where people live. This is a hierarchical group of uh, countries with one country at the top. This country sets policies that, 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 that maintain its structural advantage. Germany okay, well, has become the biggest exporter on, in, in net terms in the world. Okay, you, you made that it? point. Let me come back to Vivian. Um, people talk about a democratic deficit at the heart of the EU. Uh, they point out that in addition to your elected European Parliament, uh, there's also the European Commission, the European Court, the European Central Bank, um, institutions which lack the same democratic accountability. Some would argue that if the EU was a country and applied to join the EU, it would be rejected because it wasn't democratic enough. Do you agree with that? No. Do you think the EU is solidly democratic organisation? Well, it's more democratic than some of our member states. Okay. I'll tell you why. We have the freely elected, directly elected European Parliament, who then co-decide on legislation. The other part of the co-decider is the ministers of the 28 member states. So you have the ministers as a Senate, if you want, and the Parliament as a Parliament, and together they have to agree so that a law becomes aren't a law. Aren't you missing out a rather key institution, the one that makes all the that proposes yes. all the legislation. And then you have a government, hmm? out of which I was part. The European Commission. Absolutely. You call it the government. I call it the government. And it's not elected. <laughs> no, come on. Um, the heart of the EU, the government, then, no, your come phrase, on, no, come, come. is not elected. It's not elected. Come on. But who? But I haven't voted for it. Has anyone here no. voted for the European Commission? No. Oh, no. Two, two hands. Two hands out of 300. Look, there are two things. Uh, the members of the government of the European Commission are proposed by the national government. And then they have to go through something which is very particular, which is the same in the United States, but not in one single of our national states. They have to go through a hearing in the European Parliament and they can be oh. rejected. Oh. Huh? They oh. were, there was one oh. which was, which oh. was rejected. Please. Huh? Please. Well, you will learn that. You are very new. Um, <laughs> yes. It's, yeah. It was so, already um, agreed. Already agreed. It was a beauty if parade. I, I always the say European as a good Commission. Touch, okay, so what is, how would you describe the European Commission? It's indirectly elected. What is your description of no, the Commission? The commi for, for the first time, there was an indirect election now of the President of oh. the European Commission. Yeah. The Christian Democrats were the strongest party family. All the others agreed that yes, they should have their candidate become a president. The Parliament voted yes to this president and then he built his government. And then again they had to vote yes to the full government after having passed the hearing. I make a bet with you. Okay. If the national parliaments could, before national ministers become minister, make them pass through a hearing, half of the ministers wouldn't be in the governments. But it's a parliament that doesn't initiate legislation. It can only, it, it can only ask the commission to initiate legislation. The commission yes. has executive and legislative power and isn't chosen by me. I didn't pick those yeah, well, commissioners. Uh, I didn't uh, get a ballot come, paper with their names no, or let, their parties No, no, come, come, come. Let's not go now. Uh, let's not talk about democracy. No, let's not turn around because I have already given this answer to you. No, you let's explained not, a no, very no, no, indirect process. No, no, Very no. distant from public in which, how do I get rid of the commissioner? Isn't democracy all about getting rid of governments? How do I get rid of the government? Oh, yes, that's very easy. Yeah. Parliament does it. Like Parliament gets rid of a national uh, government also at the national level. So it, the, the crux of the matter here is the European Parliament, which is directly elected. And the European Parliament decides if the proposals of law uh, become law, yes or not. Vivian, there are those who would say that the EU isn't just undemocratic, it's it anti-democratic. Oh. It dismisses the views of EU voters. In Ireland, famously, voters rejected the Lisbon Treaty in a referendum in 2008, and EU leaders then pressured Ireland into holding a second referendum the next year until they got the result they wanted. How is that democratic? Do you think that we forced each voter in Ireland to change his mind? I'm saying, so I'm saying you didn't accept. I'm saying you didn't accept the result of a national referendum. Um, well, Nicola, well, President I, I, Sarkozy said at the time, "The Irish will have to vote again." Ooh, that's real democratic. Well, uh, is that how democracy works? Yeah. Well, I have I always had my problems with President Sarkozy. You know. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was okay. the enough is enough how about, story how about, about, how about uh, Don Claude Juncker. Do you have problems with him? 
I am working together with Jean-Claude Juncker since 35 years. Lovely. Well, in 2005, Jean-Claude Juncker, when France was discussing whether to vote on an EU constitution, he said at the time, the man who's now the president of the EU Commission, he said, if it's a yes, we will say, on we go. If it's a no, we will say, we continue. Yes. How does that work? And he continued, and now he's the president of the European Commission. Let's go back to our panel. Stephen Hassler, you were, you were kind of interjecting there very furiously when we were talking about the Commission. Uh, when we talk about democracy, can you seriously say that the public, at least, or even political scientists, can consider the EU to be a democratic body in the commonly understood nature of that term? When you have a democratic system in a, in a continent-wide structure, you're going to have uh, problems with massive participation. I think you can have a democratic system, uh, but the way you do it is you increasingly elect your officials. For instance, I think we ought to have direct election of the President of the United States of Europe. I believe we yes. ought to do that. I think we're moving towards that. Margot, and when we do yes, that, I, I think we'll solve agree. part of the problem. Okay, Margot Parker, do you think the EU is getting more democratic? You're elected. Not at all. Oh. The ordinary people that I deal with yeah. when I go out campaigning, they mm -hmm. say to me, the EU you. What is that doing for me? They feel so far away from what happens in, in, in Europe. They, they just think all of these things are happening in my life and I have no say on it. Costas, you were making a point earlier about institutionalised austerity and failed economic policies. Would you say that they are linked to this so-called democratic deficit? There's the no question at all about it. I think there's a misconception here. Democracy is based on the existence of a common people, a demos. There is no demos in Europe. There are 18 different uh, peoples in the Eurozone and 28 in the European Union, each with their own uh, democratic structures. We're pretending that there is a European people here. There, isn't, there is no such thing. And, that, and the lack of this is what's behind um, the, the, the democratic deficit. And I'll tell you how it manifests itself. From where I'm sitting, what I see in, uh, the, in the mechanisms of the European Union is a system which pretends to be democratic, but it imposes on various countries rules and regulations in the interest of big business and big banks. That's what I see uh, across the board, and I, I also see a naked exercise of power. That's how it works. There is no demos, Vivian. This is Costas's point. Uh, mm, I'm not sure. I am a Luxembourger, a proud Luxembourger. I'm different than you are, a Greek, a proud Greek. And you should stay Greek, I should stay Luxembourg, Luxembourg, but we should work together. We will never become a melting pot. We will keep these differences, we will keep our languages. Fortunately, that makes us so special, that makes us so extraordinary. One last question before we do go to a break. Um, you've called for a United States of Europe. In 2012, you, you said we're aiming for the same sort of democratic federal constitutional form as in the USA. I would ask you this, you know, who actually wants that? I believe as a politician that you have to dream the future. And yes, I would like to have a more federal structure in Europe because I believe that in a globalized world, that is our only way to survive. If not, another part of the world very soon is going to come and impose their views on the European okay. continent. Well, on that, on that oh? note, perfect note, we've got to take a break there. In part two, uh, we'll be talking about the EU foreign policy with the former uh, Vice President of the European Commission. Should the European Union aspire to be a superpower? And why doesn't Turkey seem to be welcome in the EU club? We'll also be hearing from our patient audience here in the Oxford Union. Join us after the break for Head to Head. Welcome back to Head to Head on Al Jazeera English. We've got the former Vice President of the European Commission, now MEP, Vivian Redding here with us. Uh, Vivian, Henry Kissinger, the former US Secretary of State, is said to have once asked, who do I call if I want to call Europe? Uh, a question which was supposed to demonstrate uh, the lack of a single foreign policy across a continent made up of different nations with different interests. 40 years after Kissinger left office, does Europe, does the EU now have a common foreign policy? Is there a number we can call? <laughs> yes. Um, if he is a Minister of Foreign Affairs of a big state, he can call the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the European Union. Who is that? That is now a young uh, woman who was a Foreign Minister of Italy. Okay. What's her name? Mogherini. Do you see my point? A lot of people would argue there's a lot of people out there who have got these big jobs, big titles. Are they speaking for Europeans, ordinary people? Europe is 
very big mm. and sometimes Brussels and the decision making there is very far away. People even don't understand the decision making in their national it's state. True. So to understand the European one is very difficult. But people might understand what British interests are or what Britain should do in X, Y, Z or Italy should do or France should do. They don't quite get the idea of what the EU, does the EU have a single position on behalf of 28 countries on various global issues? It does have. The ministers of foreign affairs are sitting together regularly and they try to come out with a common position. Sometimes this is difficult, you know, because if you have a foreign policy only, a common foreign policy only during five years, but during hundreds of years you had a national foreign uh, policy, to bring that all together is um, in the thinking alone and in the mentality a very difficult task. It's mostly difficult for big countries who had been used in the past to play a strong role. And does the EU aspire, in your view, to be a, a superpower, a global power? If it does not become a global power, it will completely be failed because other superpowers will take over. Well, if we talk about EU strength, the EU tries to project strength, but it's actually quite weak at times. Um, for example, if you take Russia, where there's been a big row over Ukraine and the Crimea and the EU response. Um, the EU wants to criticise and condemn and sanction Russia for its actions, but imports 30% of its gas from Russia. And therefore, many argue that's why it has so little political, let alone military, leverage over someone like Vladimir Putin. That's a fair criticism. That is an absolutely fair criticism. Look what our uh, prime ministers have uh, decided uh, together um, uh, lately uh, to have a real energy uh, union in order to solve this uh, problem. Uh, because you see, all this comes from the fact that so far each member state on its own has only cared for itself. Um, there are those who say that the EU should take some responsibility for what happened in Ukraine. Uh, Sigmar Gabriel, Germany's Vice Chancellor, said in May that the European Union has made mistakes. It was certainly not smart to create the impression in Ukraine that it had to decide between Russia and the EU. He's right, isn't he? That's a fair point. That is an absolutely fair point. This is a very big mess. A very big mess. What and I'm saying is you would accept the EU played a role in that mess. It wasn't just all evil Russians. EU played a role, Russians played a role and Ukrainians played a role. Uh, now, somehow we have to get out of this mess. Because I tell you something, even if we have a problem now with Russia, Russia is in Europe, on the continent. And if we want or not, it is going to stay on the European continent. So it's going to be also in the future one of our neighbours. So we have to live together with Russia and find our way in order to do things in a democratic and a peaceful way. And we were talking in part one about democracy and the nature of democracy in Europe. Um, I know you were a great supporter of Timoshenko, but did you support the toppling of the president, Viktor Yanukovych? Despite all his sins, he was an elected president of Ukraine. The EU were very quick to come in and approve of a new government that was installed after him. Well, I think they had some kind of elections, didn't they? Belatedly. But yeah. the actual removal they of Yanukovych. They, well, we are not taking the decision of the electors. The electors have to do that uh, but themselves. It wasn't electors, it was a coup, many would argue. We, well, there are many coups going on in many countries. Fortunately, they don't not, all get the blessings of the uh, EU, for, is my point. Fortunately, not in the European Union. Let's go to our panel on this. I just wanted to bring you in here, uh, Margot Parker from, uh, from UKIP, from the UK Independence Party. Your party loathes the EU so much that you've put more of the blame on Brussels than on Vladimir Putin. Is that fair? Uh, no, I don't think it's fair. I think uh, we disagreed with the meddling of uh, Brussels. We thought that it was inept and, and they were far too involved. They shouldn't have been so involved. Uh, and at the same time, yes, I mean, you know, you can't say that Russia had clean hands, you know, they played their part as well. So everybody has a bit of a bit of an angle going on here. And I don't think anybody comes out of it with clean hands at all. Stephen, you talked in part one, Stephen Hassler, you talked about in part one about um, your desire to see direct elections to the president of the European Union. Vivian talked about federalism in a federal Europe with a common foreign policy. How do you iron out the differences between 28 member states on something like how to treat Putin. There were several countries in the EU that didn't want to put severe sanctions on Putin, well, several that did. 
you'd iron them out in exactly the same way you iron them out in the United States of America. Well, different where states in the US don't have foreign policies of all their kinds own. of different interests, and you have a common foreign policy. Without a common foreign policy, you have no foreign policy at all, because the nation states of Europe don't have a foreign policy. Britain doesn't have one. Germany doesn't Britain have Britain doesn't one. have a foreign policy? No, they have an American foreign policy. Okay. They follow, they, no, no, no. They follow the United States of America. Our national leaders have to stop squabbling. The alternative to this is that we will be balkanized in Europe, as each nation state fights for its own corner. Not only will we be balkanized, People on the left ought to be aware that we'd be rolled over by multinational companies yep. who can pick and choose between each nation state and we'll be rolled over by the United States and China as they become big boys. So it's in our own interest to get united on foreign Costas, policy. If you, Costas, if you have a united Europe with a common foreign policy, you'll be able to stand up to multinationals and big corporations, says Stephen. Can I just say that some people would interpret the EU policy in the Ukraine as American foreign policy rather than EU policy. I mean... So it isn't just Britain. <laughs> uh, Fair point. So, um, and can I also say that I've got a long memory and I remember e uh, EU intervention in Yugoslavia. And that was anything but stabilizing, anything but uh, um, averting civil war or bringing uh, peace and democracy uh, to the country. It was actually stirring the pot of, uh, of, of civil war. But um, this argument, this, this, for me, it's a canard that... Uh, uh, we will get together, we will form this single state, and this single state will stand up against all these uh, uh, f uh, huge multinationals uh, and so on. What do I see in practice? I see uh, mechanisms emerging across Europe which facilitate the operations of big business and big banks in Europe itself. We're running out of time. I want to bring in the audience. Before I do, one last couple of questions. Uh, what happened to Turkey? Will it ever join the EU, in your view? Is there a bias against Turkey because the EU is a Christian club and Turkey is a Muslim-majority country, so it's not welcome? I don't know if uh, the EU is a, a Christian club. Have you seen how many uh, uh, non-Christians are living on our territory? Or how uh, there's a, many... There's a fair few EU leaders who said we don't want many more via Turkey. No, Turkey is a huge country, uh, which would, if it would become member of the European Union, what I do not believe it will, at least in the next decade, um, Why not? If it would, because this is not a small country uh, just joining, that would be a, a, nearly a continent. And we would have to completely reshuffle some of our policies, agricultural policies uh, being only one of those. I believe, nevertheless, that we should reinforce our neighborhood policy Fine. because we have for outside borders yep. and uh, we have to live in a responsible way just with on, just our on turkey before we move on mm -hmm. when the former prime minister of france said in 2004 do we want the river of islam to enter the riverbed of secularism in reference to turkey that had nothing to do about the faith of turkey well i cannot comment on all the stupidities prime ministers sometimes say yeah? fair enough <laughs> fair enough Let's Let's go to our audience here in the Oxford Union. We've talked about the economy, we've talked about democratic deficits, we've talked about foreign policy, we've talked about Turkey. Uh, I'm going to go to this lady here in the pink jacket first. Thank you, Vivian. With the mandate for the, for the UK to remain in the EU at a wafer-thin level, how do you rate David Cameron's chances of renegotiating our relationship with Europe? We are here in a um, university and let me say in Latin, pacta sunt servanda, uh, which means that agreements which you signed, you have to keep them. And um, all the treaties which we have in Europe have been negotiated by all the member states of Europe. So if you want a new treaty, well, then you have to open the treaty which exists now, have a negotiation with 28 member states, 28 mem 27 na member states have to agree with your okay. do you particularities. Think it do you think it, it will happen? No, it will not happen. And do you think Britain will leave the European Union? It is not in the interest of Britain to leave the European Union because minimum Great Britain needs our market. Uh, let's go to the lady here in the yellow top at the front. Okay, thank you. I'm from Eritrea and indeed the European Union is one of the biggest uh, funders or aid providers to the regime that is known to be one of the world's worst dictators. 
and yet the European Union continues to fund Eritrea, and Eritrea has now effectively become one of the largest refugee-producing countries, including uh, one in four refugees in some European countries right now. Um, we cannot choose the regimes, but we have chosen to help the people. And that is why we have the development aid, uh, and we are still giving it. We Vivian, know you could do more to help the people in those countries, perhaps by offering more refuge to asylum seekers and refugees coming into the EU. There's a reason the EU is called Fortress Europe. We have a sacrosanct element, and that is the refugees. If somebody is attacked to his body, his soul, his belief, cannot live freely. Uh, loses his freedom, then we have the obligation to receive those people. But you don't exercise that obligation very often. This we have roughly um, 300,000 uh, people per year asking uh, to have the statute of a refugee. They are but thousands analyzed. are also dying trying to get into the EU and Amnesty International, for example, has accused the EU of shameful inaction uh, resulting in a spiralling death toll. You know, we've got less than 5% of Syria's refugee population is in the EU. We're yes, the one of the, and, richest, um, the biggest, richest single market in the world. Are we doing our yeah, bit on the refugee and, front? And when you see what is going uh, on in the countries around of Syria, uh, those countries, and I would like to honour those countries, which receive hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, refugees. We, by the way, we help uh, them in order to support uh, all these uh, people. But it is a very difficult question. And because it is such a difficult question, uh, the uh, new uh, president of the commission has given the responsibility for this question alone to one single uh, member of the uh, commission. Because we need to take that in hand and we need to find solutions. Uh, the horror stories which we see on the Mediterranean cannot go on like that. Okay. Let's go back to the audience. Uh, let's go to the gentleman there. My question is that in Greece, two elected governments were elected on anti-austerity rhetoric and then they turned around and continued to do what the Troika has demanded of them. Now we're seeing the, late, the, the current government impose unbelievable cuts on health, which has seen malaria returning to Greece. Do you still think that there's not a democratic deficit there? The national parliamentarians are voted not by Europe, but by the national electors of a country. A, a country has the parliament which it elects, and in this parliament the majority elects a government. That is how it functions. If that government then makes a policy which the parliament doesn't agree for, well, the parliament can oust. Uh, this uh, government. So and Vivian, your belief, genuine heartfelt belief is uh, if the Greeks or the Portuguese or the Spanish elect a government with a majority which says we don't want to do what the EU Commission and the Troika tell us to do, everything's fine. You'll say, the EU will say fine, go on your merry way. That's what you believe. No. There won't be any pressuring. Sorry, we do not pressure the voters. The you voters pressure governments. Uh, Come on. The, this is, the this voters is... decide on a government. And Maybe next this is a election. Very kind of no, no. Textbook explanation of policy. In Sorry. the real world, no, Vivian. No, in the real world, I am a Democrat. And in the real world, I have to accept what people vote. Even well, if we they already make discussed the Irish example, there wasn't much acceptance of that vote. Well, um, there was an acceptance of the second vote. Because <laughs> you got a second vote. Yeah. Let's okay. go to the lady there. Yes, with your hand up, you wait. Yes, yes, stand up, yep, you see. If the Eurozone had stuck to the debt GDP ratio that there was at the beginning. You wouldn't have all of these problems that there are now. Why didn't they stay to the debt GDP ratio for entry? This is and the stability who, and growth pact. And rules. who benefited from them not sticking to that? Okay, Vivian. Yes, that uh, was an action which I thought was very negative. It was done uh, by France and uh, Germany at that time and everybody was uh, suffering because the stability pact had not been observed as it should. I think we have learned a lesson. We have understood very well that if we have established rule by all, 
then we have to apply these established rules also. And you cannot go out of these established rules, because if not, the family cannot function. And that is also why we created, after the crisis, all these new rules in order to have a better control of who applies what in what member state. And not to have the member states who control themselves, but to have the community to control themselves. That's why, for instance... But Vivian, the do you see how people are, Vivian, do you see how people in Greece and Spain will say, when France and Germany break the deficit and budget rules, they get away with it. When poorer countries break the rules, we get austerity imposed on us. Do you see, Costas talked about hierarchy within the EU. It's pretty transparent. It was in 2003, I think. When this and it happened, happened again after that. When the, stability, the when the stability pact was... Uh, well, now, you, if you uh, think about France, you're absolutely right. We gave, the, uh, we gave to France already twice the possibility to apply the measures before uh, they are punished, and they still are not there. But there was a double standard. Is, you accept that there was that a double is standard. Why, that is why the new commission now is going to fully apply the... Well, let, well, let's see what the new commission does. Was there a okay. double standard? Yes or no? There was a sort of flexibility, you can call it. That's a great politician's mm -hmm. answer. Lady here in the black top. Um, I'm Romanian. I've been here for four years. I have a diploma from a British university. I pay my taxes. I never lived a day of benefits. Yet every time I applied for a job, I felt that I have to leave my nationality out because of stigmatization and because of pernicious attitudes towards Romanian immigrants. Now, my question is, uh, Mrs. Parker, uh, when is UKIP going to stop making sure that the spotlight is on extreme unrepresentative immigration cases only to support uh, a policy, a party policy, and institute a climate of fear. Firstly, let me just explain a little bit, and I think we have suffered greatly from a lot of press uh, misreporting, but you yeah. does talk a lot about Romanians. That's not a press uh, no, made-up no, no. thing. No, no, no. I mean, it's not Romanians. You might talk about Bulgarians. It was the principle of actually the over free movement coming into the UK. But you have singled out yes, Romanians, have you not? Well, I've heard UK politicians talk about high crime rates from Romanians. Well, some That's have, some have, and, and others, and others. Didn't Nigel Farage say you should be worried or anxious if a group of Romanians moved in next door to you? Well, no. Isn't I'm that just, quite I'm, racist? Uh, no, 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 I wouldn't say that's racist at all. It's I mean, okay to be it, worried. No, 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 it's okay no, to be worried. No, 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 let me finish, let me finish. Whether it's Romanian, whatever nationality, it's just making sure that actually the country can cope with free movement of people coming in because actually it's not good for Romanian people to be actually abused by cheap labour and brought in falsely and then after a while they don't actually achieve Margo, or retain you, that would job. Would you be worried if a Romanian family moved in next door to you? Of course not. So just Nigel Farage, just your leader is worried. No, I don't think so. I th well, he said he was worried. He I think it was a throwaway nonsense remark that's, you know, it's gone on. He and repeated it two days later. Well, possibly um, he did. Let's go back to the audience. That girl here in the green cardigan. Yeah. You say the Troika didn't impose this highly unpopular, undemocratic, unjust and ineffective austerity measures on Southern Europe, but that had such dramatic consequences for the populations there, but I come from Spain, in that nobody wanted austerity. We, in fact, voted a government out because of the austerity measures that he imposed, and we got another one that imposed the exact same measures, only worse. So please don't insult our intelligence say, saying these were only proposed, because that's not the case. Spain received an eight only for its banking sector, because several Spanish banks were on the bankrupt uh, uh, levels. It was not a Troika question like in, uh, in Greece or in other countries. So it did not have uh, on other policies the same uh, questions applied like uh, in Greece okay. or in other countries. Uh, I want to take one from the back. That gentleman in the glass has been waiting for it, and then this lady here has been waiting very long. Following that, ele that election, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker said that this um, commission was Europe's last chance. Would you agree with that, and what do you think, what measures does um, Jean-Claude Juncker specifically need to take in order to make sure that uh, um, the okay. European Union does not blow its last chance? Jean-Claude Juncker knows perfectly well that if he wants to succeed, he needs a team which is working like an 
army going into the same direction with full speed and everybody doing its work fully. And he Issuing needs orders as well? Hmm? Issuing orders like an army? Oh yes, you need, you need a boss. You need a boss if you want to succeed. You cannot have 28 people doing whatever they want. You need to have a clear way of doing it and you need to have an implementation of what is doing. Why does he say that? Uh, because now is the moment that with the investment package, with uh, the uh, digital um, uh, continent we want to build, that we can bring the boost to this European uh, Union and that is exactly okay. what he Last wants to do. Last question here, can we get the microphone up at the front? So the rise of the far right or the populist right across Europe is a very worrying phenomenon, not just at the European level, but also at national levels. How is the mainstream going to regain the trust of their voters without pandering to what the populist right is asking for? I do not have the uh, solution to this. I can only tell you my experience, my 35 years experience in politics. Never try to bypass somebody from the right or from the left because people will always vote the original. Be yourself, stand for your ideas, go out to defend them. Then you are getting the uh, approval of your people. And on, on, on the specific ma mention... <laughs> on the specific point about these populist right, radical right, far right parties and the threat they pose to the EU. We talked earlier about distrust. Given the crisis of confidence and the economic crisis, um, how confident are you that the European project will survive, to use the last chance phrase, that in 10, 20, 30 years time we'll still have an EU and a Eurozone? And if not, what do you think the dangers are for Europe? Are we talking about a return to conflict? A lot of people say the EU is responsible for peace and stability. Therefore, in the absence of such institutions, are you worried about a return to conflict, national rivalries, war, what? First, economically, we will be completely inefficient. We are economically only efficient because we are, for the time being, the biggest economy in the world. If we do not play on this ground and continue to develop that with an aging continent as we are, we are going to go backwards. That is the first thing. The second is a political one. You can only have an influence in world affairs if you are strong. If I go as a Luxemburger out, do you think somebody is going to listen to me? No. But if I go in the name of the European Union, yes, because I am a world power. And we have to stay a world power in order to be also a world economy. But Europe for me is more than an economy. It is values, it is beliefs, it is rights of the individual. And if we want these values, this belief and these rights to be protected, then we can only do it together. Well, on that note, we'll have to leave it there. Vivian Redding, thanks so much for joining us on Head to Head. Thanks to our panel for coming here today. Thanks to you all in the audience at the Oxford Union. And thanks to you all at home uh, for watching. Head to Head will be back next week. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's great.